This is the second in a three-part series. And if you didn't get the first, you could go to our website and, and uh, get that. If it's not posted, it will be soon. We're talking about the tears of Jesus. So if you've had a bad day, it may get worse as a result of this evening. But if you hang tough, it'll, it'll get better. Talking about a bad day, did you, did you hear the story about Peter when he was letting people into heaven and it was backing up and he decided to prioritize a bit and only let people in who were having a bad day? First man said, I, you wouldn't believe the day I've had. I've been thinking my wife was unfaithful to me for a long time, and I decided to come home early from work and catch them. Went in, and nobody was there. But I knew that somebody was there, and I started looking for him. And I, and I finally went out on the porch of our 15th floor condo and there's a man hanging over the side. And I got a hammer, and I started hammering that sucker's fingers until finally he let go, fell 15 floors, but he fell into the bushes, and he got up. So I went and got the refrigerator and drug it out on the porch and pushed it over and hit him on the head. But that sucker was heavy, and I had a coronary. And that's why I'm here. I've had a very bad day. <laughs> Peter turned to the next man, said, and you? And he said, I've had a bad day too. He said, I was on the 16th floor of my condo building, and I was exercising, and I slipped off the treadmill and fell over the side, and I managed to grab the apartment underneath and hold on, and this fruitcake came out with a hammer and started hammering on my fingers, and I finally let go, and I was okay until he threw a refrigerator on my head. I've had a really bad day. And Peter said, yeah, you have. You come on in. And he said to the other one, he said, well, what happened to you? Well, he said, you're not going to believe this, but picture this. I'm naked hiding in a refrigerator. <laughs> I'm sorry, we'll take it out of the CD for you. <laughs> you know, I love the idea of Jesus with a sense of humor. Elton Trueblood wrote a book a lot of years ago called The Humor of Christ, and I love that. And I love, I love the pictures of Jesus with children. Uh, the joy he feels and the way they love him. I love the smile of Jesus, but sometimes we forget that Isaiah the prophet said the coming Messiah would be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And so we're continuing with this series this evening. If you were here the last time, we went with Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane as he faced his darkest, most painful hour. We saw that he didn't run, that he didn't play games, that he couldn't do it by himself, and that he only had the resources that you have when you weep in the silence. And then tonight, we're going to go a fairly short walking distance from that garden to a hill outside of Jerusalem overlooking the city. And then the next time I'm here, we're going to go from there to a graveyard and look at the tears of Jesus. If you have your Bible, and if you're spiritual, you will. Turn to Matthew 23, and I'm going to read uh, at the end of a very harsh statement by Jesus about the religious leaders. 
there is such pathos in what he says at the end that it's arresting. It's surprising. Listen to what Jesus said after being very angry and very harsh and very critical with tears. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. See, now your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And then flip over to Luke's account in the 19th chapter of Luke. It's kind of a cross-reference to what I just read to you. And one of the two times in Scripture where a writer specifically talks about Jesus crying. And I'm going to start at the 19th chapter, round about the 40th verse. 41st. And when he drew near and saw the city, Jesus wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. This week, I called a friend of mine in the north. Her name is Mary. Thirty years ago, she was drunk and she heard me teach, and I talked about Jesus, who wouldn't be angry. And she ran to him, and she's been sober for those 30 years. Now she's in hospice. Now she's dying. When we talked, we prayed together, and we laughed, and we told jokes. She has a whiskey voice, and I love to hear her talk. And she's earthy, and she's real. But we cried together, too, because she's going to die. And as we prayed, I sensed that Jesus was there, not altogether different than he was on that hill outside of Jerusalem. And I sensed that even Jesus was sad as Mary and I prayed. You say, but Steve, she's going to heaven. What's wrong with you? Don't play that denial game. That's not natural. It's scary and it's dark. And that's true with Jesus too. In a moment, we're going to ask why he was weeping. But before we do that, let me go down just one side road, and I want you to pay particular note to the fact that in the midst of the laughter, and if you look at the context of this text, it's right around the triumphal entry when the people sang the songs and praised the coming Messiah. It was a time of great joy in the midst of the joy. There's one man who is weeping. It was a joyous occasion. I know later they were going to hang him on a cross, but for then they were welcoming him with great joy, and he was crying. A number of years ago, I was teaching a number of churches in Tennessee in the mountains. I was a young minister in those days. I had hair, and I didn't have the wrinkles I have now and hadn't suffered the pain that I felt over the years. 
Some of these lines are worry lines, but some of them are laugh lines, too. But I got the message that my father was dying. Nobody I loved and was close to had ever died, and I was shaken up. My father was not a Christian. He was led to Christ on his deathbed. But I had more love from him, unconditional, without reservation than I've ever received from anybody else. When I read that Jesus said, if you then being evil know how to give good stuff to your kids, how much more your father in heaven. I read that and thought, that is so wonderful. If God loves me one-fifth as much as my father, I've got it made. I can do anything I want, go wherever I want, and do whatever I want to do, and he'll love me anyway because my father loved me that way. And when they told me he was dying, I fell apart. And I'd gone there to minister. There were five churches. They couldn't pay me anything, but they cooked good. And they had dinners every night before I preached. One big old pastor, and I don't even remember his name, must have weighed 300 pounds. He looked at me crying, and he reached out and just enfolded me in his arms. And he said, son, use this. Every time you talk to 10 people, seven of them will have a broken heart. I've remembered that over all these years. When you've been a pastor, as long as I have, a lot of people tell you their secrets, and you, and you listen to their pain, and you know that they're faking it and wearing a mask that smiles like the mask of an actor at a party when inside they're dying. Longfellow said this. He said, when you see a man or a woman, remember that so many have secret sorrows. And when they seem hard, they just may be sad. One of the privileges of being a pastor for so long is that people tell me stuff. They figure nobody's as bad as Brown. I can tell him anything. <laughs> and there's some truth to that. So people tell me their secrets and the places where it hurts and how their hearts are broken. And sometimes I would go to parties and I would look at the people in my church who were laughing and dancing and singing and getting down, and I would know the truth of the secrets of the pain they bore. So remember that the next time you're at a party. Maybe, uh, maybe you're the one. Maybe you seem hard because you got secret sorrow. Maybe, maybe you want to cry when you listen to the dance music. Sometimes it's helpful to remember that you're not alone. Jesus wept when they were having a party too. Well, let's turn to the subject at hand. Did you know there's a theological debate in reform circles about whether or not God has emotions? <laughs> in the Westminster Confession of Faith, there is a statement that God is without passions. Now, it doesn't mean what some of the theologians say it means but they're willing to die on that hill saying that God is a God without emotions. And so they bow down and worship Allah. And that drives me nuts. Martin Buber, one of Bill's guys, the famous Jewish theologian said, we, watch, we worship an I thou, not an I it. And that's true. And when you look Jesus, you get it. There's a wonderful prayer in the rabbi's manual. I may have told you, it goes this way. Thou art great, and we are small. 
Thou art infinite, and we are finite. Thou art eternal, and we tarry but just a little while. Thou art everything, and we are nothing. But with all of thy power and all of thy greatness, thou dost bend down low and listen to the sound of our tears as they strike the ground. True. But if we study the Word and read about Jesus, he doesn't just listen to our tears. He doesn't just, as the psalmist says, keep our tears in his little bottle. His tears mingle with ours. And I move the previous question. Why? What was Jesus crying about? Well, it's obvious when you look at the text that I read to you that he's crying over the sin of the people he loves. You, you're killing the prophets. You're stoning the people who are sent to you. And don't point at somebody else. That's us, too. We have a, we have a discipline process in reform circles, and we almost always do it wrong. We're shocked at sin. How could you, after all that Jesus has done for you? My secretary said, Steve, this guy's crying, and he's a former pastor, and he says he wants to talk to you. I think you better talk to him. And this has been years ago, and I picked up the phone, and he's given me the freedom to share this story. He said, Steve, I want to thank you. He, had, uh, he said, let me, and he said it through Psalms. He said, let me tell you my story. He said, I was a pastor in South Carolina, and I fell in love with a lady on the Internet. Never met her. Left his home, his ministry, his two children, and his wife, and traveled to Iowa, I think, to meet a woman he had never met before because Satan promises really cool stuff, but he never delivers. I was thinking, you know, a sinner can repent, but stupid's forever. <laughs> and he said, I got out there, and you know what happened. It was awful. It was just terrible. He said, he's, he said I decided to go home, and my wife, and by the way, Patty, his wife, stood on the doorstep with their children and said, we love you. If uh, when you come to yourself, come back home. And we'll welcome you. Now, if I did that, I, the last words I would speak is, honey, where did you get that gun? <laughs> <laughs> she, uh, she, uh, but that's what she, she really said that. So he gets to thinking, everything's going sour. It's dark. It does. And, he, and then she sends him a tape that I did. We did tapes in those days on Grace. It was a cassette. And he said, Steve, I played it over and over and over again till I wore it out, and it wouldn't play anymore. And he said, I got in my car, and I headed for home, and I knew it was over. My ministry was gone. My wife still loved me, but I wasn't sure what was going to happen. I'm a carpenter, and, you know, I could, I could do some work and maybe make a living. But it came back. And I wanted you to know what had happened. He told me the story. The guys in the presbytery surrounded him and they held him while he wept. We never do that. They paid for counseling for him and gave him support. And then they put him in a church to grow. And after three years, he was restored. And I wrote 200 churches across America to find a place for him. And he's in Pennsylvania now because the elders in that church said, we're screwed up and he's screwed up. It'll be a good match. <laughs> and listen to me. God is using him in such wonderful ways. I talked to him yesterday. It's so cool. Just, and I rise up and call him blessed. That's not the way we do it most of the time. I have a friend, his name's Ken Smith. He's a Baptist pastor. 
I, we get together around Christmas there. He's my age to make sure that one of us hadn't died. He said to me, he said to me the last time, maybe did I tell you this? He said to me last time, he said, you know, Steve, I'm limiting the people I spend time with. And I said, really? Now that you're retired, you can do that. You don't give a rip. And he said, no, it's not that. He said, I've decided I'm only going to spend time with people who will cry at my funeral. Uh, I like that, but there's more. I'm going to spend time with people who will cry over my sins. You ever had anybody cry over your sins? It's amazing what that does to you. I eventually became a good student, but I ran away from kindergarten and graduated third from the bottom in a very big high school. But I started changing because of a history teacher who asked me to stay after, after she had given the exams, and she gave me mine, and it was an F. And I prepared myself for the thing that I heard all the time that still drives me nuts. You're not living up to your potential, duh. You're not living up to your potential. People still say that to me. And I'm old. And I thought she was going to say that. She handed me the exam, and she started crying. And I didn't know what to do. I thought, what's with that? Ever have anybody cry over your sins? That's what we're here for. We're not here because this is a grace church or because I'm a grace teacher. We're not here just saying, all right, go out and swing. People say, I encourage sin. I don't. You, you guys, I know you guys. You're doing fine. <laughs> you don't need any encouragement. But you know, but you know what we're called to do with Jesus is to look at the destructiveness of my sin, and I struggle so much. And I want somebody to weep over my sins. And it's helpful to know that he does. And then he didn't just weep over the sins of the people. He wept over the pathos of a fallen world. Oh, my. Now, you need to know that he loves Jerusalem, so he knows what, and, and his prophecy came true, by the way. In the year 70 A.D., the Romans came and did exactly what Jesus predicted. But Jesus wasn't just looking at Jerusalem. He was looking at Fort Lauderdale and Miami and the United States and the world and the pain and the devastation. He was looking at Iraq and Afghanistan and the hatred and the division and the balkanization and the, and the pain that's everywhere. He looked at Katrina and that moment and wept because of a fallen world. Let me let you in on a secret. If you're talking to a pagan, you can answer every question they have except one. And that's the one on suffering. Where was your God when my kid was killed? I've got cancer. And you say God loves me. He doesn't love me. He wouldn't treat anybody he loved this way. My wife left said she had to find herself, and I'm dying here. How does a good God let... And what about the suffering and the sorrow and the hunger in the world? I don't have an answer for that. But I know that when I've dealt with Skeptics Forum, those are unbelievers who were there to ask questions, I made sure that I dealt with Jesus before I dealt with suffering. And I told him about his tears. I think when we get home, Jesus will say, if I could have done it another way, I would have done it another way. And so we walk in the dark. All things work together for good. We walk in the dark trusting things that are insane and counterintuitive, and we do it because of his tears. 
don't forget to tell them about the tears. And then uh, Jesus not only wept over their sins, he not only wept over the pathos of a fallen world, he wept over their outright disbelief. How often I would have gathered you as a hen would gather her chicks, and, and you would not. You didn't know the time of your visitation. That's still going on. I have a friend who just got back from Scotland. He told me he was at St. Giles Church in the parking lot where they used to have a plaque on a parking meter where remembering John Knox. Oh, I love John Knox. He scared Queen Mary spitless. <laughs> she said, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than an army of 10,000 men. And Knox would cry out, God, give me Scotland or I die. And there was a little plaque this big. And my friend said, it's not there anymore. Now that would generally tick me off. But it made me sad. I said, I see Michael and Betty, some dear friends. They've heard me say a thousand times, I don't care if people go to hell. I mean, I have friends that stand in malls and weep over people that they don't even know. I don't know their names. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't care, but God has been changing me. Because I've been hanging out with Jesus. And I can't say I go to malls. You know, I'm not a girly man. I don't go to the malls and look and cry and stuff like that. I can't say that I have this great burden, but I know it's growing. When he told me about the Knox thing gone, I felt really sad. And when I read Hitchens, I wanted to weep. That's what Jesus does. You know, you know, he's done everything. The, when the scripture says, the fool had said in his heart, there is no God, that's a statement of fact. There's got to be something abnormal about you, something that is blowing smoke, saying, I will not, something that wants your own way now, and that burns me up. I'm so tired of listening to the talking heads saying stupid things, the drivel of pagans, the shallowness of the atheist of our time. But I've been hanging out with Jesus, and I've seen his tears, and I understand that the appropriate response is not anger, but sadness. He wept over their unbelief. And then I'll tell you something nobody ever told you before. When Jesus wept on that hill above Jerusalem, he wept for himself. If you listen to what I taught you last time when I was here, and you never listened to me, but if you listen to what I taught you the last time when we went to Gethsemane, this was a very human Man, the incarnation was not a game. He was facing the cross, and it scared the spit out of him. And he knew how deep and profound it would be and how much it would hurt. Not the nails, the cosmic battle where he was the center. And he wept. And now he looks out over Jerusalem. It's a week before he dies. And he wept for you, and he wept for me, and he wept for our world, and he wept for himself. You want to drive me nuts? Tell me, Steve, I don't pray for myself. I pray for others. When I was a pagan, I had better words for that. What are you, crazy? <laughs> Nobody's that spiritual. I spilt water just a week ago. I, I make coffee in the morning. It gets me up early. 
and I usually get a big mug of ice water and put it on my desk. And I knocked it over on my computer and my printer and all the work I was pa- preparing for that day. And then, and then I, then I, have you ever heard a preacher cuss? You say, Steve, you're probably not even saved. There's cancer in the world, there's war and starvation, and you're, you're cussing and spitting and complaining about spoil, spilt water. That's neurotic. No, it's not. At that moment, the most important problem in my life <laughs> was spilled water on my computer. And the most important problem in your life right now is the place where it hurts. Don't, don't do that spiritual stuff. Well, I only pray for others. Man, when you got cancer, pray for yourself and weep. When your kid's not walking it and you don't even know where he is, pray for him and pray for yourself because that's a hard road to hoe. I've been meeting regular with a teenage friend of mine, a kid I love, and his girlfriend broke up with him last week. He just sat there and cried. I said, son, this is hard. He said, yeah, it really is. I didn't say, look, there are a lot of people going through worse stuff than you're going through, but at that moment, it was, may have been puppy love, but it was real to the puppy, and it really hurt, and it was hard. And I said, let's pray. Let's pray about your girlfriend and the way it hurts. And if you're dealing with a, a, you know, you lost your job, don't just pray to God for others. Pray for yourself. Weep for yourself. Shed the tears. There's a wonderful thing in the Chronicles of Narnia where Diggory, well, maybe it wasn't. It was one of the kids. His mother's really sick, and he... He wants Aslan, the lion, to do something and heal his mother. And it looks like Aslan's not going to do anything. And so he looks down, and he, he won't look up. And all he can see, Lewis says, are the paws of the lion. And then he looks up, and his eyes meet the eyes of Aslan. And he notices the tears in Aslan's eyes. And Aslan says this, Child, it's a very hard world and we must be kind to one another I know there are people with problems bigger than yours but put you on the prayer list too sometimes the hurt is only there to send us to him I have a friend in North Carolina who sometimes comes to Orlando and he, uh, he likes to go to SeaWorld. He's a physician, uh, dermatologist. And uh, he loves to eat in the restaurants at SeaWorld. He told me the other day, he said, you know, every time I eat fish at a restaurant at SeaWorld, I have this feeling that I'm eating a slow learner. <laughs> Is that funny? <laughs> That's what I am. I'm a slow learner. Sometimes I don't think I'm ever going to get any better. Sometimes it's dark. And then I remember his tears. Grace is sitting right in front of me. What a wonderful name. You know what she did for me last week? And she did it. She's charismatic, and I told her, if you're going to pray for me, don't do it in tongues. I want to know what you say. Anyway, that was after she told me. She sat down. I thought she was going to ask me a theological question. I'm, I'm good at that. I do this for a living. I would have fixed it. I would have spoken from Sinai and made it okay for her. She, or I thought maybe she was going to ask me to pray. Everybody knows I'm ordained, and I have this connection that you don't have. And, and I pray good, too. You know what? She sat down, Bill, right where you are. She sat down right next to me and said, may I pray for you? And I went, yeah, I'm scared. 
And she did. Because she knew at that moment that even with cancer and war and hunger, there was a preacher who was worried about what he was going to say. That's okay. He knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we're dust. You think about that. Amen.